Today I want us to start by thinking, what do we look for or expect from the future? Do we think that the future is just always going to be great? Do we think that the future is always going to be terrible? Do we have a viewpoint somewhere in between? For this topic today, I, I have to confess before I get going, I am failing miserably in what I'm going to share with you today. And I don't like to do it, I don't want to be a hypocrite when I do things, but the what we're going to talk about today is joy. There's a huge, in my opinion, difference between happiness and joy. So we just got back from this beautiful place in Australia and New Zealand. We saw all these amazing things and I had so many moments of happiness throughout that trip. Now happiness is an emotion that's temporary, that's fleeting, that you can be happy one minute, like for example, it's a much lighter illustration, but if I hit all the signals, for 4th Street, 6th Street, and 7th Street on Pacheco, I'm happy. But then if I hit a big long way in a red light at 8th Street and then at Mercy Springs, the happiness goes away, right? Happiness is very fleeting. Now there's a greater emotion, if you will, that's used much more often in the Bible that's called joy. And that's what we're going to focus on. Joy is possible to have other negative emotions and still have joy at the same time. The Paul says at one point that you can be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So regardless of whether you think that the future is going to be beautiful or the future is going to be terrible, I would argue that you should have more faith if you think everything's going to be bad in the future. But we can and should look at the future with joy, not just from where we stand now, but from what is coming in the future. The joy is truly coming in our lives. So to start this off, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Peter 4 and 13. So, of course, there's a lot of suffering mentioned in 1 Peter, but as it talks about on the Wednesday night class, a lot of grace, a lot of God's blessing as well. So, connected to that, it says, 1 Peter 4 and 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. So, obviously we know, regardless of what you think about the future, that may or may not be different than what you experience right now. And the Bible says that all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So we would be ignorant, of course, and you live life so you know, to think that we would be without suffering at this point, or even if we feel like we're without suffering at this moment, to think that we're not going to have suffering sometime in the near, relatively speaking, future. So, the problem is, though, is that we are supposed to rejoice, not just thinking about the great things God has for us in heaven, because that's what's talked about in the last part, but to rejoice right now in that suffering, looking forward. I used to think and feel very guilty because I used to always look forward to my vacations. And I used to, I mean, literally like two months away, that's what was most exciting to me is thinking about how I'm going to get to go on this trip in two months. I used to feel really guilty. But at some level, it seems like it's okay to have joy looking to the future because that's what it's telling us here that we can and should do. But, of course, we should find joy in just beyond looking at the future. We can and should find joy for things in the here and now. And to look at that, we're going to look at First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 10. First Chronicles 16 and 10. First Chronicles 16 and 10. The Bible says, speaking of God, glory in His holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad or rejoice. So, we talked a couple weeks ago about letting our light shine. That to let our light shine, basically the key maybe in starting, if we're in Christ, is to let everything else that stands in our way of letting our light shine be removed. Lots of times the things that keep us from having joy might also be the same things keeping us from letting our light shine. If we're focused on things that are negative, that are stealing our joy, that are making us not want to sing and be happy, that not want to represent Jesus in the best possible way, there are things in life stealing our joy. And so to let our hearts rejoice when we seek God, it's a seeking that pushes everything else away. 
Now, I don't know about you, but maybe when you were a kid, you used to play hide and seek. To this day, that's still one of my favorite games in the whole wide world. What we do is sometimes with the kids here, to add an extra level of difficulty is we'll turn off the lights. So all we have is the light that's coming through in the window. And so it's one of those things that when I'm playing that game, to me, I have this great joy because I'm not thinking about anything else but hide and go seek. And I'm enjoying playing with the kids. And there's points in our life that might be that simple and that beautiful to us. Where we're just rejoicing because we're focused on God. We're focused on whatever it is that brings us joy. And all the other problems in this world seem like nothing. Or at least in some way are forgotten from our minds. But the problem is, a lot of times, when we don't have joy, it's because we're not focused on God and seeking Him and rejoicing in that. We're focused on these other things that are stealing our joy. So we want to be people that seek God and rejoice in doing it. I could play hide and seek one of my favorite games in the world and have a bad attitude about it. I could say, man, why is this kid coming high next to me? They're going to give me away. You know, I could think of all these things, potentially, that could steal the joy that I have. But for whatever reason, in hide and go seek, nothing seems to ever get in my way. I always manage to rejoice in it. But we know, unless you're a perfect Christian, we probably don't experience the joy of the Lord perfectly 24-7. So we know that as we seek God, we have to rejoice and to not let the other things stop us from rejoicing in the Lord. So fortunately, God gives us a couple ingredients, if you will, for how to have this constant rejoicing in the Lord. So the first ingredient we're going to find is in John 15 and 11. John 15 and 11. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, which of course we're his disciples for today. John 15 and 11. The Bible there says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So he is not just saying, I want you to have a little bit of joy. He's saying, I want your joy to be full. For example, we rented a couple cars when we were uh, going to out Australia and New Zealand. And the first car we rented, it was no problem because we didn't drive that far, so the tank was pretty close to the full, right? And so we had a different thing in New Zealand because we were driving super far away and it was hours. And so there was a part of me that was wondering, I think we can get back to our hotel without filling up. But the danger of that, of course, is that you run empty. So spiritually, we might be tempted at times when our joy isn't full to continue to run without replenishing our tank. That we might say, you know what? I don't have that much joy, but I'm not going to go to the source that Jesus is saying right here to where we can find joy. And he explains that he is sharing these words, which for us is this, the word of God as recorded. Of course, they heard him speaking these words out loud. But he says he's speaking these things that we might not only have joy, but that it may be full. And it's amazing to think about Jesus having joy because he made me have the hardest job of anyone that ever walked the earth. We are supposed to strive to be sinless. But as the Bible clearly says, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yet he knew if he messed up once, the whole plan God had would be destroyed. He had all these disciples with him that for three years were still making mistakes. We're still fighting about who would be the greatest and having all these issues in their minds. When they had walked with the perfect Son of God. So we want to look at the Word and say, you know what, by joy, I want to be full. But if we're not deeply taking in Scripture, frequently taking in Scripture, if we're running how I was tempted to do in New Zealand and just keep driving the car and driving the car, maybe I'll have enough fuel to make it through today, we're going to get hurt sooner or later. I don't know how many times you've tried to push your car past the E. I, I don't want to tempt you in telling you this, but when that red light goes on, your car's not going to run out right away. You can push it a little bit further, but the problem is you don't know how far you can push that car. You don't want to push yourself in any way spiritually beyond what is safe and wise to do. I mean, spiritually, we can fill up with the Word of God every single day and should. It should be beautiful to us. It should be a conversation that this is God's means of speaking to us and we need to take it in fully. And we know that we're close to someone in this life. We probably talk to them on a regular basis. We probably talk to them how many minutes a day. Maybe even hours a day. How much conversation do we have with God? How much do we listen to Him? 
And the other side of it, not just that we're listening to him, but that we're speaking back. And so another key to joy is in John 16 and 24. John 16 and 24. It's only uh-oh if uh, you're not doing it. It says in this, Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So it's not enough to have a one-sided conversation. Imagine, like, for example, I was calling Guy every single day. And I would call him, and I would email him, and I would text him every day. And he never responded. Well, how am I going to feel about that relationship? I'm probably going to feel, man, this is kind of lame. Guy, you know, might feel the same way. He's like, man, Glenn keeps bothering me, and I, I'm not trying to talk to him. Of course, we know that if our you know, conversations with people on earth were one-sided, that would be terrible and unreasonable. What if Guy always returned my phone calls? What if we always talked and always responded to each other? What if the conversation was always a two-way street? Maybe you know people that they dominate the conversation and you're not even talking to them, you're just listening to them go on and on and on. But we know that's not a true conversation the way it's meant to be. It's meant to be a dialogue back and forth. The same is true for our spiritual dialogue with God. Some people are great in prayer. Some people are great in studying the Word. But the key to have the true joy, because he's saying you get it from both these avenues, is to have both. To not be a person that has a one-sided conversation, always just speaking to God, or always just taking what he's saying and not saying anything back. That we need to ask, because God is able to give us joy and to make it full. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to stop at the gas station? If you could pray and God filled up your gas tank? Man, that would be great. And you know what? You think gas is expensive out here? Try filling up at gas out there. Nicole saw the gas prices and it said like almost $2. And she's like, man, that's a good deal. But you know what it is, how they measure gas out there? By the liter. And if you're not aware, it's about four liters in a gallon of gas. So it was like 60 something dollars to fill up this vehicle that was barely under half a tank. Man, it's expensive. But praise God that when we are investing into our conversation with Him, that it's only blessing. You might say, well, I don't like to do it, or I don't feel comfortable doing it, or I don't get that happy doing it, I don't have this full joy in this conversation with God. But in Jeremiah, it's going to show a key to maybe if you're not quite there yet, how you can get there. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah 15 and 16. So Jeremiah is speaking about the words of God. He says, Jeremiah 15 and 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. So he ate them at first, and it says they became a joy to him. There's things in life that aren't always a joy at first. For example, I got to have all these cool experiences in Australia. One was I got to eat kangaroo. Now you know how people try stuff and they say it tastes like chicken? Kangaroo does not taste like chicken. And the first bite that I had, it was kind of gamey. It was kind of chewy. It wasn't the best thing I'd ever eaten in my life. And I was a little bit disappointed because, you know, when else am I ever going to eat kangaroo in my life? I wanted to really enjoy it. But it was interesting because the more I ate that burger, because it was a kangaroo burger, the more I liked it. And by the end, it was great, and I would have eaten some more if I had had it. But sometimes you enjoy and appreciate things more and more over time. When we deal with people, sometimes the more we get to know someone and appreciate them, the more that we love them, the more joy we have with them, and so on and so on. Sometimes you might meet a perfect stranger and just have this great conversation and just be best friends from that, but usually it's the deepening of relationships over time that make them more and more special and joyous to us. So for us, we need to realize that God can be the delight of our heart. Hearing His words and sharing our life with Him can and should be. He's the best friend we'll ever have. There's times that you might not want to hear what he has to say, though. For example, yesterday I was reading something in the Bible and I felt like I wasn't praying in the best spirit because, like I'm trying to confess earlier, my joy, I feel like, was weak even though my happiness was high. 
I had things in my life that were defeating me, I felt like too easily over the course of this trip, and even the past day or two, because I wasn't receiving the joy of the Lord. I was receiving happiness that came from experiencing life events. For my days, I have a set amount of time I spend, just as a given, of reading the Word of God and in prayer. And those times significantly went down. So while I'm having all these mountaintop experiences, doing these great things, we had a rental car that we were supposed to call, you know, for the shuttle to come pick us up. And then they come, you know, take us to the rental car and we go to our hotel. So it's about midnight and we call and they don't pick up. And we call and we call and we call and we call and leave a message and we call and we call. And they don't pick up. And it's like after midnight at this point. We're in this country that we don't, you know, know the hotel's not nearby. I mean, what do we do? I mean, we pay for this rental car already. And man, I was in a terrible mood about it. Way worse than I feel like I should have been because there were taxis outside. We ended up taking the shuttle back. It wasn't the end of the world. We ended up getting the car the next day. It was upgraded. But I didn't handle it well because I was focused on happiness instead of joy that comes from the Lord. And that's a terrible thing because if you're flying through life grasping for happiness... And that's why a lot of people engage in a lot of the terrible stuff in this world. That's why a lot of people don't have lasting happiness. Because they're thinking after one, whatever it is that's their fits in terms of giving them happiness, that they're going to stay happy. But then it goes away, and so they're looking for more, bigger, greater. And people are looking for all these things to make them happy, when really what we need is the joy of the Lord. And if we don't find this joy from this conversation with him, we need to invest even more into it. We need to find an even greater relationship to where we can have this and to joy to us whenever we go to God in prayer. That we get a smile on our face whenever we open up the word of God. And it's a daily continuing conversation. Let's go to Psalm chapter 30. Because maybe you like where I have been often on the past couple of days. And you don't have the joy as much as you want. And you're trying to seek it, but you haven't found it yet. So we're going to read in Psalm 30 in verse 5. This is speaking about God and His view. Because God doesn't let us always have joy. I mean, there's times that He allows us to go through different emotions and things in life. Verse 5 it says, For His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So God does get angry. I watched this movie that was interesting, kind of relates to adult classes, called Inside Out. And if you haven't seen it, it's a Disney movie. It came out a couple years ago. It's a very interesting movie. So there's this little girl in the movie, and it shows like the inside of her brain. And it kind of shows the different emotions and the way they interact with each other. And there's one emotion, and it's my favorite, of course, it's called joy. And joy wants to always win out. Joy wants every moment to be happy, to be a big smile on the face, big whatever. And Joy, if she had her way, would not let any of the other emotions ever come into play. There are other emotions like sorrow and anger and fear. And some of these things are not healthy in most settings, right? And so Joy always wants to win and never wants the other emotions to have any sort of say whatsoever. But what's interesting is by the end of the movie, there was a point that Joy realized that one of the greatest, most joyous points in their life was when her parents comforted her in a time of sorrow. Now, if you look at the things in the Bible, if you look at the nature of God, God has all these different emotions, too, that He has given us. He may manifest them in a better way than we do, but He has times that God is sorrowful. We have times that we are sorrowful. But interestingly, the times that I prayed most on this trip were the times when I suffered hardship. The times when the shuttle didn't come and I'm praying because I don't know what to do. And so I keep praying for this wisdom. The times that we have sorrow in our life, often God wants to use to bring us back, not just to joy, but to a closer walk with Him. And if that requires more conversation with Him, if we're pouring out more prayers to Him, if we're taking in more of His Word, or at least thinking about how to apply it to get out of this situation that we don't really want to be in at this moment... It's a good thing. And we don't like that. I mean, the beginning of the movie when Joy said, I'm just trying to be happy and I want every moment to be filled with joy and nothing else. Man, wouldn't it be great if life was like that. But we know from what the Bible is saying that joy might not be here now, but it's coming. It's a promise from God that, you know, we may endure for a night. You might not have the best day today. You might not have the best day a few days from now. But joy comes in the morning. 
that with God, each day is a new day. Each day is a chance to start over in our mind, in our hearts, and deal with the things that we have within that particular day. Because we can't change the past. We don't necessarily know what we can do to alter the future, or if the things we hope to will happen just how we want. But God's able to change it to bring us joy in the morning. Let's look at verse 11 in the same psalm. It says, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. So David was a guy that his joy was expressed a lot in dancing. It's not a requirement, of course, to dance and have joy, right? But he's saying that you take away my sackcloth, the thing that people often use to mourn, to show their sorrow, to show whatever grieving they're going through, and if you imagine sackcloth like a burlap sack, imagine wearing a burlap sack on your skin. It would be very difficult. It would be painful, right? But it says, you have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. You have clothed me with joy. So that's what we should want to happen. That we should want to continue with the sackcloth. God does use these other emotions in our life for periods of time. We should have a fear that's a godly fear of Him. If our anger causes us to act righteously in a situation that needs justice to be brought, hey, that's okay. But we need to manifest these things to the end of joy and the end of a closer walk with Jesus. A better conversation with Him. For the last verse, we're going to go to Psalm 34 and verse 8. Psalm 34 and 8. The Bible says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. So we need to not just taste one time, although that would be good, right? There's people that have never tried to draw close to God. they never experienced the blessings within. I have a friend of mine that at one point when they were younger, they were seeking God in their life, and it seems like as far as I could tell, when I knew them well, it seemed like they weren't really seeking God very much. But yet, interestingly enough, Recently, they've been asking more for different prayers for things in their life. Because they realize, in their own way, God, are you not the best way? They're trying through me to taste and see that the Lord is good. Because they're seeing these prayers for things that they want in life to get answered over and over again. But what I'm trying to encourage them to do is to taste for themselves. You can have someone tell you the kangaroo is the best food or the worst food or whatever it is, but you'll never know until you try it. You'll have people tell you all day long, having this super deep conversation with God throughout each and every day is a beautiful thing. But if we're not experiencing that, we don't know till we try it. We want to have, if we want to do the will of God, our lives in tune such a way that if we want happiness and joy and all these things to continue, and we don't want to just get beat up through life over and over again, it's through seeking God in a closer relationship. Sometimes, before even the prayers have been answered, the circumstances have changed, just the joy comes because we're closer to God. Because He's the one that gives the fruit of His Spirit. He's the one pouring this out into our lives to give it to us. So we need to taste and see. If being just happy or chasing after happiness alone has it done it, it's because we're looking to the wrong source. We need to look to the joy of the Lord, a daily, frequent, continual conversation with Him. That we do not look for it in any other way, because there's so many things you can do. I mean, you can have this mountaintop experience of going on vacation and say, oh, I'm back. Where am I going to go to next? And constantly be seeking everything but the God that gives the joy. But let's not seek in Him. Even if you get to look at pictures online and that's your vacation, whatever it is, you can get joy in Him. You don't have to go anywhere except to His throne, to His Word, to receive grace and help in time of need. So of course we know these things are true by faith. But if we never step out on faith and do these things, we won't know. And we never turn away from sin if sin is drowning out the joy in our life because it's distracting us from this pure walk with God. We need to put it away. And of course we need to confess the name of Christ to help all these people be saved so they can taste and see that the Lord is good. In the class in uh, Sunday mornings to talk about evangelism, and it's a really good thing. And like, for example, this morning they were doing these different steps you can go through in teaching people. Now it's good to go through those steps because I would argue at some on some level would have to believe all those things to be saved. 
But we might not have enough time or opportunity. Sometimes just one thing we can say, one thing we can do can help that person if they're just seeking the joy to say, hey, I find my joy in my daily walk with God. And you can too. And of course, we have to be baptized. That's the end of the journey in terms of this seeking of God to start the relationship, but then the relationship continues to deepen. Just as we're joined in any kind of relationship, whether it be business or marriage or whatever it is, that that connection, once it's made, should make us stronger. But praise God, because in baptism, it gives us things that we don't get in any other relationship in this world. We get the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the gift of the Spirit. We get all these things that we just abide in this relationship with God. So if there's anyone that you haven't entered this relationship yet through baptism, or you feel like your relationship is strained and needs help, we can help you with that today if you come forward as we stand and sing. Why do you wait, dear brother?